herself ready for bed. She puts on her pajamas. She has those pink cow spotted pajama pants on. And she has this real big long white shirt that looked like a dress. She has her pink fluffy slippers laid out on the side of the bed. And on the nightstand she has her phone volume turned all the way up. Her keys and her wallet. She would do this every weekend for five years straight. One particular night, her son will call. She'll roll over, she'll answer the phone. And at that moment, her son will say, Mom, my car is acting up. It broke down. Can you come help? She rolls out of the bed. She slides on those pink fluffy slippers of hers. She grabs everything off her nightstand and she darts out the door, rushes down the street to get her son, jumps his car. And as she leaves him, she says, there you go. He'll say, Mom, thank you. She'll say to him, no thanks needed. I stay ready. Though we may not know the time, we should be ready at all times. Though we may not know the time, we should be ready at all time. Are y'all still awake with me tonight? I hope y'all doing good. Y'all doing good? Well, I'm excited because uh, the, ba- the worst thing you can do is have some people preach before you preach. Because that makes it bad for those who are sitting down because then you just got a bunch of people who just love to preach. Just building off of each other. So now we have Brother Ryan, we had Brother Turnquest, who I call Brother TQ. But keep that on low. Don't tell them that. I call them Brother TQ. Now they preach. Now I, got, I have to contain some of my energy back because I'm excited. You know, sometimes it gets hard when you try to uh, communicate God's word when you're, at a, uh, when you're in a position where you're excited. Because you got to hold a lot back because you don't want to, ah, but that's how I feel. That's how I feel. And so I just want to thank you, brothers, for speaking and uh, presenting God's word to us. This is actually my last time speaking to you guys on this trip. Uh, that my wife and I are down here. We'll be here Sunday. Uh, Bible class starts at 10 o'clock. Be here. If not, I will leave judging you. I'm just playing. I won't. I really won't. I really won't. (laughs) But please do come. Uh, But this is my last time speaking, and I'm so thankful, and I'm so excited to jump off this new year with you guys. We have really built a family with, uh, with you guys down here, and we're excited about that. Our lesson for today is Matthew chapter 24. So if you will turn there with me. Matthew chapter 24. And we will start with verse 36 through 44. Now, Brother Ron, keep doing that. He's going to make me preach some more. So, yeah, yeah, I better shush him now. Or else. (laughs) We may be here until the next New Year's. Just a matter of time. Matthew chapter 24, verses 36. And it reads. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. For the coming of the Son of Man will be like the days of Noah, for as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then there will be two men in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and one will be left. Therefore be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. Where we are at in this particular story is that Jesus is nearing his crucifixion. And his disciples and them, they're in the temple, and they leave the temple, and they go, and they will sit on the Mount of Olives. And the disciples will start to ask Jesus about this thing called the end time. They will start to ask Jesus about when is it coming? And Jesus will respond in the way that we just read. He will say, no one knows. But he say, these are the things that you can see to let you know that they are upon us, that the end time is near. He says, nations will be against nations. There will be war. 
There will be trials. There will be tribulations. He was saying there will be chaos in the world. And that's how you know that the end time is upon us. But they will question him a little bit more. And that's where we will find our lesson. Though we do not know the time, we should be ready at all times. Let's look again at verses 36 through 39. But before we jump into text, I want to tell you what happened on my 21st birthday. On my 21st birthday, it's a big deal. You turn 21 one time. You turn 21 one time. And though most people are excited to, you know, go out and, you know, drink or whatever for their 21st birthday, I was opposite. I was excited because my wife said that she had a day planned out for me. So I was like, <laughs> okay, let's do it. Let's do it. And so, you know, I woke up to breakfast smelling good. Favorite stuff being cooked. Then throughout the day, she'll check up on me. At lunch, she'll take me out on a picnic to a park. And she got, she, I, I like manwiches, you guys. And, and my wife knows, only I make my sandwiches how I like to make them. Because my wife, like, you put too much meat on there. But for this particular day, it was my birthday. She made me a man with y'all. And she got me root beer in the glass bottle. I love root beer and man witches together. And then she made me some cupcakes. It was over. I mean, she pulled out all the stops, people. And then she took me to Sonic to get a slushie. If I wasn't married to her yet, I probably would have pulled a ring out at that moment. I thought the day was over. I mean, it was going good, and now it's time to go home. I'm like, okay, it's done. You know, I'm good. Walked up to the door, opened the door. I see about 20 shoes on the floor. I'm about to get upset because I'm like, 20 pairs of shoes? Who all these shoes belong to the next day? I know people popping out everywhere. Happy birthday, surprise, surprise. Somebody was about to get popped, though, because I didn't I know what was going on. But when I found out, I realized my wife has just thrown me a surprise party. Let's look at the text in verse 36. But of that day and hour, no one, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Until the day that the that Noah entered the ark and they did not understand until the flood came on and took all of them away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. The disciples were questioning Jesus about the end time. They were asking him, when will it occur? And Jesus will tell them, no one knows, not the angels, not even he himself, not the Son of Man. No one will know when the end time will come but the Father. He will compare the end time to the time of Noah and the ark. He'll say it'll just be like then when everybody during that time were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. Does that sound familiar to our time? Yeah. People were just living their life, doing what they do on a regular routine day. They were getting up, going to work, going home, going to dinner, eating breakfast with the family, all that. They were doing everything normal. The next thing you know. The flood came and they didn't know what was happening until it started happening, until it was too late. The doors are now shut on the ark and no one is able to come in. Jesus will compare the end time to this time. I think that's pretty interesting because uh, we have a lot of people today who want to say the end time will be 2012. How often do we see scientists saying, oh, well, we can predict based off how the forest is growing and how plants are dying and how the environment, how global warming is, uh, is moving forward. We can tell by these things that the world is going to end this particular time. Or we even have theologians today that are saying, well, based off these particular numbers in the Bible, based off these particular events in the Bible, we can tell that the end time will be this particular time. Do you know how many times our world would have been destroyed if we relied on science and we relied on theologians and we relied on human beings to tell us when the world is going to be over? Do you know that even they don't know, if the angels don't know, if the Son of Man don't know, if we don't know, if the only one who knows is the Father, then all those people are wrong. 
And it does us no good to tune into the news to see when the end time is going to come. The only thing that Jesus has to offer even his disciples is the fact that this is how you know the end times are upon us. And that's when you see the world going in shambles. I think the world is going in shambles now, right? The signs of the time. But even if we are in the midst of the signs of the time, we still do not know the time itself. It will be as my surprise birthday was. A surprise. Though we may not know the time, we should be ready at all times. I remember when I was in third grade, I know it almost seems that everything bad that happened to me was in third grade because I was a bad kid in third grade. It didn't keep going further in the fourth grade because I got beat too many times in third grade. But don't tell nobody that. But in the third grade, my teacher left the uh, classroom. She had to go use the restroom. Now, this was not normal. She had to go use the restroom, and she said, okay, everybody stay in your seat. Do not talk. Continue your work. I'll be right back. Well, we're thinking right back was about five minutes. She came back in two minutes. Do you know what the room looked like in two minutes when she came back? Papers flowing everywhere, people up out of their seat talking, and I was one of them. I'm going around to everybody, cubbies. Hey, you got a pencil? Hey, you got some candy? Hey, how you doing? What we doing at recess? We playing tag or we playing kickball? What you want to do? And so that was me. Next day, I know I'm in the midst of doing this, and my teacher is opening up the door, and I'm like this. You know what my teacher said? She said, everyone who is sitting down, not talking and doing their work, line up. You're going out to recess. And everyone who is standing up, talking and not doing their work and not following my instructions, you guys will be in detention for recess. Let's look at verse 40 and 41 in chapter 24 of Matthew. Then there will be two men in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. After Jesus explained to them that it will be a surprise, this end time that they're asking about is unknown, he proceeds to say to them a very important statement. Are you guys ready for this? Because this, this is a little heavy right here. This is, this, is actually, this is actually opposite of what the world tells us. The world says that, our God is a just God, and truly, if he loves us, if he cares for us, if he's really a forgiving God, then at the end of the day, whether I did right or wrong does not matter. You following? The world is telling us that if God is a just God, then truly, at the end of the day, he's going to take everybody. There is no separation. But Jesus has said something very important here. He says it's going to be a surprise. And when it does happen, some will be taken and some will be left. That means that, yes, God is a just God. And yes, God is a loving God. And yes, God is a forgiving God. But yes, God is also a God that's going to come down for his elect. That's just for God. Because God is saying that, do this. Live like this. And if you live like this, when I do come, I am going to take those who follow me. I, I, I tell you, when you, watch, when you watch movies, a basic scene that you see in high school or any type of school with children, gym class, there's a sport. And you have two teams, and they've got to pick all the people off the wall. And everybody's making their selection, I want this person. I want this person. You ever notice how most of the time in that same scenario, there's always probably like two people that don't, don't nobody want? They're just still on the wall. If you're one of those persons, if you've ever been one of those persons, I'm not making fun of you, and I'm sorry that you are. I will always pick you, all right? I'm not that person. But what I want you to understand is from that scenario, that person that is left on the wall, that is a lonely spot to be in. That is a sad and degrading spot. That is a spot that breeds pain, that breeds hurt. Only thing that is left on that wall is you and your sorrow. Do you know that's exactly the same situation that we're going to be in when Jesus comes back? He says some will be taken and some will be left. Some will be left on that wall sitting in their pain, sitting in their sorrow. I want to be picked. I want to go to God. But what's so interesting is that the Bible tells us the only way to God, and I spoke about this on Sunday, the only way to God is through who? Jesus Christ. 
Jesus Christ, Jesus is saying some will be taken, some will be left. Let's break this down. Let's, let's break this down. Because there are some people who don't believe in the idea of heaven and hell. There are some people who do not believe in the idea of heaven and hell. But what's so interesting is that let's, let's set up the equation like this. Even if you do away, which I say don't, but even if you do for those people who don't believe in heaven and hell, even if you do away with this terminology, heaven and hell, let's just do, deal with God and not with God. If life and light is found with God, what's the opposite of that? Darkness and death. If life and light is found with God, then what is found outside of God? Darkness and death. You can't tell me that there is no such thing as hell when you have over here darkness and death. That is enough hell for all of us. I want to go with God. I want to go with the life and the light. And if the only way I can go with the life and the light is through Jesus Christ, then through Jesus Christ, I am walking in. I want to be chosen, though we may not know the time. We should be ready at all times. It will be a surprise, and some will be taken, some will be left. Let's keep going. Let's look at verses 42 as we close this out. My mother would leave the house sometimes because she worked a lot, which is something that I know you guys are used to hearing in my sermons when I talk. My mother worked a lot. She had to. But one of the things that she would do is she'll leave the house and she'll say, hey, don't get on the phone. We were young. We ain't had no business. <laughs> At least no business that our parents knew about. <laughs> but I had business. I had phone numbers. That's enough business for me. Don't leave me home and tell me not to call nobody when I got phone numbers. You better take this phone with you. And so, my, I did, of course, I didn't tell her that. Don't tell her I said that, all right? Y'all y'all, y'all got my back, right? <laughs> y'all got my back. <laughs> my mother will leave the home and she'll say, don't, don't, don't get on the phone. Don't get on the phone. And so we, you know, we listen most of the time. But when I have to make my phone call, I have to make my phone call. But most of the time when I made my phone call, it seemed like my mother always came home unexpectedly. And so you know what I learned to do? I learned to take five-minute intervals off of my phone conversation and put the phone down, run to the window, look out the window. All right, she's not here yet. We can keep talking. Five minutes down the line, hold on, I got to check again. For some reason, though, my mother always came home in between those five-minute intervals. I promise you she probably had a camera somewhere in the house, and she was like, I'm going to get him when he's just walking back, when he's just walking back. She would always come home and get me. Let's look at verses 42 as we come to our last point. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. This is so amazing right now, people. This is so amazing what Jesus is saying. People will always, I, I, I go to Bible school. My major is a Bible and preaching major. And you want to know one of the things that I hear often? I just wish God would have gave us more. I wish Jesus would have said more things. Do you know that to me, I'm always like, but Jesus has said enough. And do you know what I just read to you when he said, be on the alert, stay ready. That was enough words that he had to say to any of us. This idea of staying ready, being on alert, that's the most amazing thing he could have left us with. That is a challenge, that is a, a charge, and it's filled with so much. It's filled with so much. Do you see the excitement just coming out? That's, that's how you know. I be telling those people, but he said enough. He said enough. When you look at this, he says, be on, be on the alert. The biggest question we ask, though, is that how can I be on the alert? How do I be on the alert? If it's going to be a surprise and no one's going to know when it's, when it's going to happen and you tell me to be on alert, how do I do that? You do that by staying ready. Amen. Being on alert is being in such a way that you don't have to look out the window every five minutes or wonder when Jesus is coming back because if he came back, no matter when he came back, you will be ready. You will be living such a holistic life that whenever you talk in the midst of your conversation, if Jesus were to come back in, in the midst of your conversation, you good. If you were in the middle of a thought, if Jesus was to come back in the middle of that thought, no matter what it is, you're good because you're living such a holistic life. When Jesus comes back in the middle of your thought, you're still going with Jesus. You're still going with God. Whenever you are 
finding yourself carrying out actions. Your actions are so much glorifying God that in the midst of your actions, if Jesus was to come back in the middle of your actions, you'll still be good. See, being on alert is not being cautious. It's not being uh, uh, um, um, psychotically looking out the window every five minutes trying to figure out when are you coming? When are you coming? Oh, okay, I'm good now. I'm good now. That's not what being ready looks like. Staying on the alert is not being in a state of wondering. But it's in a state of readiness so that no matter what, you're good at all times. Jesus is saying, be, don't, be don't alert. Be ready for when he comes, you won't know. Being ready is living for God through Christ Jesus. Stay ready. Some of you all are sitting here now, you're, saying, you're, you're listening, you're saying, so you're telling me that I can't have moments? You're telling me that I can't fall? No, I'm not saying that because it's, it's impossible. But that don't mean that we should stop there saying, oh, it's impossible so that I, I won't try. It's, it's impossible so that I, I won't push forward. Because that's not, the right, that's not the right term of thinking in the spiritual walk. The right term of thinking is, yes, I'm falling, but I'm always running towards God. I'm always pushing forward so that I can be at a state of readiness. Maybe not this time, but maybe next time. God, give me another chance. I'm going to do better moving forward. Oh, oh, so you're telling me that being ready means that I can't just jump out of this church life? But I want to take a break. I don't want to go today. I don't feel like talking to God's people. Man, they irk me so bad sometimes. I can tell they judging me. I can tell they looking at my life and they judging me. I don't feel like going today. Is, if you did not go and Jesus came back, would you be confident to stand before him and say, I'm ready? Oh, but I just want to indulge in my sin just for this one second. I just want to get drunk this one night and then tomorrow I'll be okay. I just want to gossip in this one conversation and then I'll be okay. I just want to eat this one last donut and then I'll be okay. I know it's gluttony, but I just, I, 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 just one last one. Oh, I, I, I just want to be puffed up. Let me feel good about myself. Let me feel as if I am okay. Brother Turncross is saying we can't do nothing without God. What if I just want to take a second and say I can do something without God, though? Are you staying in the state of readiness? Or are you tiptoeing through the blinds trying to see when Jesus is going to pull up and catch you on the phone? That's, that's the real issue. Though we may not know the time, we should be ready at all times. Don't you see how that mother, for five years straight, she'll wear her cow-spotted pajama pants, her white t-shirt that was so big that it looked like a dress on her. She would have her pink fluffy slippers on the side of the bed. And on her nightstand, she'll have her phone, her keys, and her wallet. One night, her son will call her and say, Mom, I need you to come help me with my car. She jumps out of the bed. She slides on her pink fluffy slippers. She grabs everything off her nightstand. She darts out the door, drives to her son, jumps his car. And as she walks off, he says, Mom, thank you. She say, no thanks needed. I stay ready. Do you know that mother was not staying up late at night, waking up every five minutes to check her phone? She put herself in a position that whenever her phone rang, she was able to get up just like that. She was ready to go just like that. Why? Because her son on weekends, she allow him to go out late at night. And she knew that something could possibly happen. She didn't know when. She didn't know what. But she knew something could happen. And so because of the thought of it could happen, she stayed with her clothes on. She stayed with her shoes on the side of the bed. She stayed with her keys on the nightstand. She stayed with her phone volume all the way up so that if she, if she received the call from her son, she'll be ready to go. She wasn't checking. She wasn't calling him every five minutes. Are you okay? No. She was ready. We need to be like that mother and have our slippers on the side of the bed and have our phones and our keys and, and, and our volume turned all the way up on our phone on the nightstand. We need to be like that so that whenever Jesus comes back, no, we're not looking out the window. No, we're not calling every five, ten minutes, Jesus, when you're coming back. But we are in a state of readiness so much that if it was right now, we will be the one taken because we will be ready. Some of you all in here are not ready yet. Somebody in here may not have given their life to Christ yet. May not have given their life to God through Christ Jesus. 
if the only way is to the Father is through Jesus Christ, then I charge you with that duty. If you are saying to yourself, I want to live for God. I want to give my life to God. And if the only way to do that is through Jesus Christ, then I charge you to give your life to God through Christ Jesus. All you have to do is believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. This whole year, you may have been walking, saying to yourself, I believe, but I'm not ready to give up my life. I believe, but but my, my sin just feels so good. I don't want to find myself in those convictions saying I can't do that anymore. If you are that person, then I say, put it behind you and walk into this new year with a new life with God through Jesus Christ. Here, believe this message. Repent, confess, and then you will be baptized. And when you come up out that water, you will be ready with your slippers on the side of the bed. And for those of you saying, but I have my slippers, but I'm still just waking up calling every 10 minutes. I'm still indulging in my sin every now and then. I'm still want to step back out of my Christian walk. I still want to step back out of my spiritual duties every now and then. If you are that person, you're saying, I want to become ready again, then how you do that is through prayer, collective prayer. I need prayer. Pray for me, people. Because I step in and out sometimes. But I need prayer that I stay ready, especially going into this new year. The devil is active. The devil is actively at your door, pouncing, knocking it down, trying to take out the bolts. I feel it, so I know you feel it. We're all in this together. If you need prayer, if you need anything, if you're ready to give your life to God, if you are ready to, to resubmit and reconnect back with God, why don't you come as we stand and sing?